Now, of course, those of you who are familiar with the research and the literature on this topic already know what I really dove in and learned. And like any good student, I decided to look at what had been written about this topic of the American dream. And what I found was pretty troubling. There were a couple of statistics, especially, that I was bothered by. The first is that if you think about children born in the 1940s, about half of them, or excuse me, about 90% of them could say with some confidence that they would live a life that was more materially prosperous than their parents. If you were a parent, in other words, in the 1940s, you could say with some confidence that your child was going to be able to live a better life than you were. Now, of course, a better life is a concept that's going to have a different meaning to different sorts of people. When we say that a child has a materially better life or a more prosperous life, we don't necessarily mean, of course, that they're happier, that they're more fulfilled. But economists, I think, rightfully look at this concept of upward mobility and use it as a rough, an imperfect, but a rough measure of this idea of the American dream. Because I, I really do think this, this notion that we want our children to be doing better than we are is something that's almost hardwired into the human DNA. And I think consequently, it's, it's hardwired into much of our American creed, this idea of the pursuit of happiness is in some ways just a reflection of the idea that you can go off and claim some share of the American dream and then ensure that your children have access to it as well. It's not uncommon to hear people talk about how much they want, if nothing else, for their children to be doing better than they are. So while it's an imperfect measure of the American dream, the fact that over 90% of children could expect to do better than their parents in the 1940s should trouble us not because, obviously, that was a bad statistic in the 1940s. In fact, it was a fantastic statistic in the 1940s. What should trouble us is that in the 1980s, that number is about 50%, meaning that about half of children who were born in the 1980s can expect to live a life that's more prosperous than their parents. Now, that obviously reflects, I think, a really significant shift and, like I said, something that worried me. The other thing that really bothered me when I looked at this literature is that the American dream was focused in certain parts of the country. If you were a poor child born in Utah, for instance, or in San Francisco, where I lived until very recently, if you're a poor child born in Kansas, you had a very, very good opportunity of being able to become middle class or even upper class by the time that you reached adulthood. But if you were born in the places of the country that I wrote about and the places in the country that I most care about because those were my home, then you found that children born at the bottom had a disproportionate likelihood of being trapped there. And so that was the backdrop against which I started to think about what I wanted to write. I was very troubled by the fact, not only that the American dream was in crisis, but that there was a regional component to it. This problem of folks feeling disconnected from the American dream is not a problem that developed in 2016, and it's not a problem that will go away if your preferred candidate wins in 2018 or in 2020. It's a problem that has been a very long-term, long time in the making. And it's also a problem that doesn't necessarily fit naturally into our ideological inclinations, and it doesn't necessarily have easy solutions. But it is a problem, and I'd encourage all of you, whether you just care about kids who grew up like I did, or you care about our political process, to try to understand it and try to think about ways to address it, either in your work with communities, in your day-to-day -day life, or if you have um, inclinations to work in policy or politics in that arena as well. The last point I'll make about that is that it is, of course, true that one of the big stories of the 2016 campaign is that a lot of folks switched their votes from Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 to Donald Trump in 2016. And again, in those critical states, those switching voters provided critical margin. But it's also true that a lot of working class black and Latino voters switched their votes from Obama in 2008 and 2012 to just not voting at all. They weren't so motivated that they were gonna switch to the Republican Party, but they were apathetic enough and felt disconnected enough that they weren't exactly excited enough about Hillary Clinton to come out and vote for her in the polls. And those voters, too, provided the critical margin in the other direction, the fact that they didn't show up. 
And so if you think that this problem of the American dream, or you think that this problem of frustration and resentment that's building in our politics is just a problem for the right or just a problem for the left, I've got news for you. It's all over our political spectrum, and you can see the signs of it. You can see the signs of it in the fact that Bernie Sanders almost defeated the most well-established and well-funded candidate in the Democratic Party's history. You can see it in the fact that Donald Trump crushed a field of very exciting and very talented Republican politicians. This is a weird, weird moment in American political and cultural life, and I don't think that it's going to end if your preferred candidate wins the next time around. I think that it's gonna be with us, and I think we all as citizens have a responsibility to try to address some of the problems that I wrote about in this book. It doesn't have to be at the level of politics. In fact, I think that a lot of the solutions to these problems won't come from policy at all. They'll come from communities and individuals working to solve them. But I do think that we've got to do that work because the American dream and the country that's built around that dream is just too important to give up on it. I got the idea to write the book, or I was really motivated to write the book because I, I was a first year law student at Yale Law School and I was looking around and feeling like something wasn't quite right. I'd been in the Marine Corps, I'd been at Ohio State, I'd of course grown up in Ohio and Kentucky, and yet for the first time in my life, I found myself feeling like a cultural outsider. I was at this law school, it was obviously an incredible opportunity and I was very excited to be there, but I also felt at some fundamental level like I didn't quite understand what was going on. I didn't understand the hidden social networks, the mentorship, I didn't understand why some people wanted to apply to certain jobs. Why was that job more desirable than the other job? I didn't understand even how to apply to certain of these jobs. And I slowly had this realization that this was a world that for much of my family's history, really all of my family's history until I came along, this was a world that lay hidden to me and my kind. These hidden ways of doing things, these social networks and professional lives, these things were just not something that I had been exposed to growing up. And it occurred to me that there was a flip side of that realization, that if I was a cultural outsider in this place that is, whether we like it or not, a gateway to a lot of opportunities that exist in our society, then maybe it was the case that there were too few kids who had grown up in the circumstances that I had grown up in that were making it to places like that. Maybe it was the case that this notion of the American dream wasn't quite doing as well as I would like to think it is. And of course, that mattered a lot to me because the American dream is something that really formed a core idea. This belief in the American dream is something that really motivated me and was part of my identity. I thought it was important and still think it's important that we live in this sort of country you know, where no matter who your parents are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you grew up, you can achieve your share of the American dream. But if it was the case that so many of the, the, the folks who grew up in circumstances like I did were cut off from some of these higher opportunities, then maybe it was the case that the American dream wasn't doing quite as well as I would like it to be doing. Maybe it was the case that the American dream was struggling a bit. This first excerpt it illustrates something that is really fundamentally at the heart of my thesis and the way that I think about the problems of disadvantage. And what this illustrates is that you can't take somebody from a low opportunity environment, transport them to a situation where they have a little bit more material comfort and a little bit more economic opportunity and expect them to forget and unlearn every single thing that they grew up around. In other words, you can't transfer someone from poverty to prosperity and just expect that all of their problems are going to go away. The way that we grow up, the habits that we develop, the attitudes that we form, those things continue to influence us even if we're lucky enough to get out of the poverty that we came from.